And I have the pleasure to introduce Kurt uh, Kreisinger. Uh, he is presenting on designing for outdoor living. Uh, Kurt is the president and founder of Lorax Design Group, co-founder of Tributary Revelation Professional Landscape Architect in 20 states. He has a BS in landscape architecture from Kansas State University. Kurt is an experienced landscape architect and land planner for over 27 years and has led design and consulting services for various project types throughout the United States. He has an extensive background in small to large scale projects, including residential, multifamily, senior care, high end residential, and public swimming pools, office, commercial retail, and mixed use development projects. He has a proven ability to work with each client to identify, establish, and deliver a unique design that meets the goals and objectives of each of the projects. Please welcome Kurt. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me. This has been a pleasure. Uh, this has actually been the first uh, coverings event that I've attended as to date, I've actually sent one of my employees down to one of the Orlando events years ago, um, and she'd come back and had told me how well represented the industry was at this event. And um, I likewise have had a good time being here. Um, and it's been nice to see, uh, like Randy Angel said in the previous uh, presentation, how large the products are, the offerings are available for us. And, and as a landscape architect, it's been pretty nice. Um, so today what I'm going to talk to you about is more um, about designing for outdoor living. I've been a landscape architect for going on 27 years. Uh, as, as growing up as a child, I always was enamored with uh, des the design profession. always knew I wanted to be an architect, but it wasn't until I got to college that I knew what landscape architecture was. And what's interesting about landscape architecture, a lot of people, I live in the Midwest, I'm from Kansas City, and um, what's interesting about that is that basically a lot of people don't know what a landscape architect is. Uh, and so often we're having to describe ourselves as different things to different people. But what I tell people is it's a combination of a civil engineer, a horticulturalist, and an artisan. And what that is is basically we try to become creative problem solvers for anything in the outdoor environment. So when I was asked to put together a presentation for this uh, show, I, I knew that a lot of the people here might be fabricators or tile setters or stone fabricators and stone setters and masons. But every one of those individuals has to work with either a landscape architect, an architect, an engineer, a homeowner at some point along the way to understand what the goal is for determining what that outdoor environment is going to be. As was previously mentioned in my background, I've worked all across the board. Uh, we have a small office of eight individuals, but we do work all over the country and we do some international work. Uh, half of our business is commercial, and the other half is residential. We really enjoy the residential just because it's much more personable. We get to work with the individual that actually is going to enjoy that project from a day-to-day -day basis. Where a lot of times in the commercial applications, it's kind of a, a means to an end for what we're trying to accomplish, just to get a building permit and get the project completed. So sometimes those aren't as fun and exciting as residential projects. But today we're going to focus on a residential design process. So this this, pro, this uh, presentation is about designing um, out, the outdoor living space. For those of you that are landscape architects or architects that want to uh, get AIA uh, certification, um, there is paperwork on the back table if you want to partake in that. Um, <clears throat> the learning objectives that we're going to talk about today, um, the first one is the importance of developing a design theory. The second is managing client expectations through a prescribed process. The third is understanding the fundamental guidelines of uh, gui the guiding principles of design. The fourth is evaluating uh, program elements and adjacency relationships. And the fifth is general overview of the prescribed process designed through construction. I've already gone through this. Uh, so designing for the outdoor living, what is that? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, in our minds, successful projects begin with a client's need and wants, and then they progress the programming, the guiding principles, the concepts, the planning, and the ultimately to a final uh, beautiful design. From identifying appropriate materials to scheduling layouts and securing qualified installers, our team of professionals will review the design build process for outdoor spaces and how to successfully deliver the final product to the client. So a lot of times when we get uh, approached by a client, uh, they've done their research. 
you know, the onset of the website is, in, in the internet has been really incredible for uh, us in the last 10 to 15 years because our clients are a lot more informed than they ever were when I first got into the industry. So a lot of times they are coming to us with their ideas at hand. They've either been on the website, Hows or Pinterest, or they've traveled the world because they've had the affordability in the, to go to Europe and other places and take pictures of resorts and other places that they think that they want to transfer into their own backyard space or around their entire home. The pro one of the products that we're going to talk about today to talk about the, our design process is a project that we did um, back in 2017 in Shawnee called the Wooded Retreat. So this is what the project looks like from a drone shot looking down. Ultimately, this is what clients come in. They say, we want a project that has all these different elements. How do we achieve that? Knowing that sometimes the house hasn't even been designed yet or the house has been designed, the foundation's already in. We're bring, being br brought in late into the process. One thing I like to always start with is that there always is, is an idea, and we call that the design theory. Often that design theory is something that comes either from the client or it's something where we're listening to the client and creating what that is. Um, it, it's really the why of the design. It's a concept, the idea of what it could be. It's the systematic approach used for the designer to assemble a collection of ideas that are influenced the inspiration for the design direction. And in some cases, it's the pitch to sell a concept. And we're going to get into this. So design, I call it the design theory funnel. Uh, oftentimes, uh, clients, they want to focus on the specific elements of a project, what materials are going to be used, what details they saw that they like, because they brought in all these collection of photographs, which are really good. But for some perspective, you have to think about it. That we're, we're, we're really starting out really wide at the top of this funnel very general or getting very specific. So all these collection of ideas are client and designer driven. Those are the things that we basically are asking questions of the client, we're collecting those, and then we're taking our ideas and melding those together and getting them into this uh, a design theory funnel. At some point along the process, and, and we'll talk about that today, it would, I call it the refinement filter. That's the area where we're taking all these ideas, some of them we're good for inspiration, they get pushed to the side, others are utilized and to, to create that design theory so we can get more specific with the project product. And then we finally get into what I call the, the final fluid concept. That's the concept that's the guiding principle that kind of guides the entire project. Because along the way, sometimes you're gonna have stumbling blocks where you get, get along the way and like, you come across a detail or a material selection or, or a certain element that you're like, well, how do we incorporate this in design? If you go back to the, the, the final concept that you've put on the project, it's kind of the overriding umbrella that kind of gives you guidance for how you move forward through the process. So yesterday I came in this, I sat in the same room and I, it was a fabrications forum. And what was interesting about that is they were talking about core values with your company. And what I, I always learned from other people and how they actually drive their businesses, but one of the things he said about developing core values in that culture with your company is you should write them down. I have core values in my company. I think we have great culture in our office, but I was telling my wife, that's something, the first thing I'm gonna do when I get back is I wanna write this down, because I write everything else down about our process of design, but maybe I haven't written down my core values for what builds our culture. Well, the same goes with the design process. Anytime that you, whether you're a tile, like Jimmy Reed was up here earlier talking about his process, he has developed that through his entire career. Same way with Randy Angel on his previous uh, presentation about his process and what he, his guiding principles were for guiding a client through that and navigating them through that process of how they design. We do the same thing in our design process and, I, our process, and we do write that down. And really the design process isn't, I, I say it's not linear, it's a cyclical process. It's a series of steps that allows you to develop ideas to produce the most successful possible outcome that you can have. So we break it down into six generalized ideas. The first one is to listen. And we say that we listen to our client to obtain the general information. They're gonna come in and we're really at this point in the stage in the game, we're profiling them. Whether they know it or not, we're asking a lot of questions, we're listening to what they have to say, and we're retaining that. Then the next thing we're doing is we're identifying. Um, identify the desired program elements to the question and answer process where we're defining what their problem is. Because no matter, the reason people are sitting across the table from us is because they have a problem. 
they have an issue, whether it's site drainage or whether they don't know how to lay out a space because they're not, they don't, they're not design savvy or they, they want to use certain materials and they want to pull these things together and complement the house or the architecture, they just don't know how to go about it. So we identify what those things are. The next thing we do is we gather. We gather the available site data, like things like the survey, site photos, inspirational images. Those all go into a collection of things that help inspire what the project may be. The next thing we do is we evaluate uh, the site information relative to the program elements to analyze alternatives. What direction can this project go? And then we apply that knowledge um, and that information in the form of an initial bubble diagram. And we'll talk about that to provide a solution or solutions on how the client can respond to and get feedback. And then we refine. We refine the initial concept design through the client's input. And then we repeat that process all over again. Because a, a design is not just about one global aspect of like the initial photograph we showed you of that master plan or the, the finished product of that design. There's all these cyclical little design solutions that we have to create along the way to create that project that's ultimately in the eyes of the client, the best thing that they, that's exactly what they wanted to and they envisioned or having that oasis in their backyard. So what we explained to our client is that's what our initial design process is for us internally and how we're dealing with clients. What we talk to the clients about is what is our process because a lot of people don't understand what we do as a landscape architect. Like how, how do you develop a set of plans? They assume that you just actually start drawing construction documents and then you're working with the contractor to get it implemented. We have to start from ground zero. So initially what we're doing is we're doing a concept plan. That's where we're defining um, with uses of things like the vision, board, vision boards, which we'll talk about, the program elements. We're helping define this. We're talking about circulation and existing site factors. When we get into the master plan phase, that's actually where we're refining that process of the overall design. We're talking about the program adjacencies and the circulation. Um, visualization, that's a big thing that's really transferred a lot over the last 10 years, the availability of how you tell the story by doing things in three dimensions. So this 3D visualization talks about the site fixture. We, we visually get to show what the site features actually start looking like in three dimensions whether it's structures, materials, finishes, so the client doesn't have to always re uh, rely on that two-dimensional graphic. And then finally, we talk about the technical aspect of, of this process, which is the layout, grading and drainage, details, engineering, hydraulics, all the things that may apply to how the project actually gets built. These are sometimes things that clients don't appreciate as much. They rather enjoy the design process, but we all know that a good set of construction documents is ultimately gonna give you the best project. So a lot of times clients are coming in and they're bringing us pictures like we talked about from the internet, house, Pinterest, ripping things out of magazines or pictures they've taken on their own. We take those collections of images they have for inspiration. We're visualizing what they see in their mind's eye, but then we're also taking images that we pull from our database or things that we have or just the internet to show what maybe that project may start giving other cues to the client of what materiality we're gonna use, uh, landscape, lighting, paving options, tile, all this type of things that factor into the overall vision of the project. And sometimes we're taking pictures, uh, we've created an entire um, presentation that we get in front of a client just to, if they don't know the terminology within the, a project. And today we're gonna focus a lot on swimming pools because that's a lot of what we do. We become very specialized in swimming pools, but a lot of people don't understand all the terminology around a swimming pool and how swimming pools have changed over the years. Back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, a swimming pool was maybe a 16 by 32. It had a deep end, a shallow end, and a ladder, and four foot of concrete around it. Nowadays, these outdoor swimming pools have become resort-like, no different than the, hotel, the hotels here in Las Vegas. Those, res those resort pools have a little bit to offer for everybody. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, is things like reef ledges, uh, pergolas, we have to educate, you know, what is a pergola, how does that interact, what kind of materials can be used. But these are visualizations that we have of our own to help a client further understand wh what they're really asking for. Because sometimes there's not really great examples on the internet when you're searching, so you have to drill down a little bit more and kind of explain a little bit more what options there are. Fire features, various styles, shapes, sizes, materials, how they interact. Sunken seating areas have become really popular. Uh, about five years ago we were asked to to start looking at these and obviously they become a big component with a lot of our projects. The initial process though is when we're meeting with a client is the inventory and analysis process. 
a lot of times when we don't have a survey, which we'll talk about, we still have to go gather what is available to us. And nowadays, what's kind of nice is that, you know, Google imagery uh, from Google Maps and other things like Google Earth, uh, they're out doing LIDAR scans of different cities, especially areas where we live, and those are updated about every six months. So you'll get a pretty realistic view of what that property is that you're actually gonna start looking at and analyzing for your client. So early on in the design phases, we may not necessarily have to have a survey, but we'll at least start with what we have. Other technologies that we've been using actively in our office is the use of like a drone to go out and get active shots that are even clearer than what we're actually seeing here. But the things that we initially start looking at are all the things that are really impacting a site that don't really have anything to do with the materials that you select or some of the site adjacencies or the program elements. It's more about the site factors. And that's why I always tell people when we're talking to our clients and others is that I always feel there's two clients in every project. You have the client that's hired you to do the project, but then you have the land itself that kind of tells you what it wants to be. All the environmental factors that you have to consider, like um, the drainage on the site, where are the sun angles, where, is there wind areas that you know, are gonna create channels of when they're gonna, between buildings that are come through and really disrupt a backyard, where are the access points, where are points that you have to have best views off the property. So you're looking at topography and drainage and views and sun orientation, all these things that are important so you can make informed decisions later when you're actually looking at the project. Ultimately, the project we're gonna be talking about, we do start with a survey. And the project that today that we're gonna review, the foundation was already in and the client wanted all these different things. And we always, I always relate a survey to what a surgeon would do before they do, you know, if they're gonna do back surgery or knee surgery, they have to go get an MRI or a uh, X-ray because they wanna understand what's below the surface. We do the same thing, we want, a, we want a survey, but we want a topographic and boundary survey because it's gonna give us a lot of the key elements that are important for us to actually make informed decisions when we're moving through the process. The first is that we wanna know truly where is the boundary and property on the, a particular site. Not always is that in the place where the client thinks that's gonna be. The other thing that we wanna look at is topography. How is that, the grade on that site working that, that actually affects grading and drainage when you're actually proposed. We don't want to create more problems than what the existing site already has. Look, utilities and easements. Is there a big utility easement that we have to worry about? And what utilities are gonna to have to be brought in to service that particular new project that, that helps us understand design attributes later? And the infrastructure, the paving and other structures that are actually on site that are gonna, um, that we need to be, and also the building setbacks, which are all important. Sometimes clients want us to place the building. Other times the building's already there like this one. It, the foundation was already in. So one of the things that, uh, I, I teach classes with the Watershape University, I'm actually a faculty member there, and I did an eight-part series on the principles of design. Um, it's, a, it's a class that, that, that if, if anyone's interested, you could look into that, but we won't get into all of these elements of principles of design, but when we're looking at anything, it's like whether you're a musician or artist or sculptor or what, whatnot, these are all, th an architect, these are all factors that, that roll into decision-making process when you're going through a design. Whether it's balance and hierarchy, repetition, rhythm, proportion, scale, movement, contrast, unity, harmony, variety, pattern, white space, these are all, I, in my program that I put on, I talk about each of these individually. And as a designer, when you're going through a college of architecture, or going through other classes, learning about design, you talk about all of these things and they're, they become, it's almost like second nature, like riding a bicycle where you learn how to use these when you're going through the design process. So we're not gonna focus on these individually today, but I at least wanted to bring them to your attention as we start going through some of these designs to, and I could start talking and giving you cues as to why we made certain decisions based on these principles. The one I like the most is uh, Louis Sullivan back in 1896, a famous architect out of Chicago. Uh, coined the term form follows function. As you can see from these three different pictures, form does follow function. I think too often people want, whether a house is a perfect example. People want, to, they want a specific style or specific way a house might look, but they're not thinking about that house from the inside out. The circulation paths and where the access and the adjacencies are from different buildings. Do you want your master bathroom as far away from the kitchen area? Or do you want the kitchen right off the, the mudroom adjacent to the garage? 
So people understand that a little bit more than outdoor spaces because people all live in homes. So they understand those are the as attributes that they, they, they use day in and day out. So when we're sitting with a client for an outdoor space where they're either master planning their entire project or doing a backyard more specifically, we try to tell them that form does follow function. So we want to understand what is the actual function that we're trying to accomplish here. The form, we'll get to that. Let's not put the cart before the horse. I have a good friend down in uh, Phoenix that uh, I was had a pleasure to working with with one of our clients out of the Kansas City market that was building a house down in Scottsdale. And so we flew down and we sat in front of the architect and he pulled out these Ziploc bags and he pulled out all these little colored uh, stenciled uh, patterned uh, pieces that were that represented different rooms in the house. And they were like a master bedroom's typically about this size and the bathroom's this size for a full bath and a garage, a two car garage or a three car garage is this big. And he started laying these out on the site. You can see this is a topographic survey. And he started positioning these in a way that as informed with the client and said, I want, to, I want this courtyard space and I want to access the garage from the back. And I want, to, I want this specific view. And we started looking at the grades and after we came up with one or two of these layouts, the client was able to also push and pull these pieces around too. It's like paper dolls, you know, just you're taking these program elements, but what you're doing is you're allowing the client to engage with that process. And what they f learned shortly is that it had nothing to do with what the style of the house was or what it was gonna look like in three dimensions. But functionally, each of these spaces had an adjacency that worked and they also had a purpose because they had a certain size that they knew it was gonna work for the furnishings and the, and the circulation that was gonna go through each of these spaces. In the matter of an hour or two, we had multiple layouts done. We took photographs of these and the, 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 the floor plans that came later resembled these simple uh, you know, processes of just getting to a certain point. Now we don't necessarily, now we could do the same thing when we design a backyard with the elements that we have, but we, we tend to do everything by hand. So you could see the sketches on the right are what we call these initial concept plans that are more schematic design, they're bubble diagrams. So we're sketching really quick in front of the client and try to take these ideas that they have and try to portray those real quickly on paper so that we could react quickly. And then if they have another idea, we either have another piece of bum water over the top of it and sketch another idea, but it's really quick as we're moving through these ideas with the client. You still get the same effect. Now, ultimately, the client's still sitting there like, but I'm telling you, I want a certain style. I want this thing to, to be identifiable. And what is style? Style is a set of characteristics and features that makes a building, object, or landscape notable or historically identifiable. So if they've got an Italian, Italian style that they want for their house or the mid-century modern, those are all things that make sense. But it's not necessarily that's the things that you need to inform the, the good design principles that allow you to have a space that actually works functionally. And we're going to get into that. But the pool, like if we're talking about a backyard, ends up being the 800 pound gorilla. At some point, it's the largest element that has to land and roost somewhere on the site. So ultimately, you have to generally understand what that's gonna be. So when you're, when you're sketching out a bubble diagram, sometimes that bubble becomes more like a shape, like a rectangle or a freeform shape or whatever it may be. And these are all different pool designs that we had done throughout the years that we pulled from different projects just to show there are different styles. And those styles do relate back to a certain age and time or certain architecture. So sometimes, you know, there's too often we'd go in and meet with a client and, um, and how we got into pool design is basically I was meeting with a client that had a two acre estate and had this French uh, cottage style home with the slush and brush stone and everything just was dated around that period in the home. And he says, I want a landscape plan for the entire backyard and all the patio spaces and this around the pool, but don't worry about the pool because the pool's already designed. And I'm like, okay, so can you tell me what that looks like? So he pulled out a picture and it was a kidney shaped pool with Roman columns and scuppers that were going back in the pool. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is not going well. And so I asked him, I said, would you mind if I take a crack at looking at the pool? And he says, sure, I have no problem with that as long as you're not gonna charge me anymore. I'm like, no, I, I want to include that. I, I think we could incorporate that in everything else that we're doing. A week went by. I went back to meet with him on a Sunday afternoon. I went, we went to their, their large hearth room table. I lay out my design, and I'm like, I'm really excited to kind of walk you through what we've, we've, we've prepared for your project. He gets up and leaves the table. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> he comes back with a big coffee table book and slams it on the table and opens it up, and it was Andre Lenotre's, um 
He had design for uh, 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 Versailles. And he goes, you gave us what we always wanted that kind of matched the architecture and the style of the home. And he could already tell without me even going into the presentation that what we had designed complemented everything else, from the materials and the layout, the circulation that complemented the entire project. So it's good to know from a designer's perspective early on what a client wants in a pool so that you're, you're listening to your client, you're not ignoring them, but you want to slow them down a little bit, put the brakes on, because too often they want to get to the end um, before we actually get in through the process. So there is a process to all of this. And at the end of the day, you get beautiful looking projects that all have a different shape and style. And they're important to how they complement the house. Ultimately, a lot of our projects, I, I tell clients, if you look at our website, you could pull down 12 different projects and they're all uniquely different because we like to design for that client, but also know that it's gonna complement the architecture that's also involved with the project as well. So what is a concept plan? Um, in relative terms. It's initial freehand comprehensive visual graphic that studies the organization of program elements and their relationship to one another. Process, understanding the guiding principles of land planning. Well, the first one is program elements because we, clients are gonna come in with their wants and needs. The things that they, the, these are the things that we have to have in the project. Those are the main design elements um, and the adjacencies are gonna be important with this for the space planning. The other one is the circulation and flow. Clients don't necessarily like to talk about this because they don't think about it, but like we talked about the house um, designing a home. If you look at a house or any public space like this building that we're in, the conference center, what drives this entire project? It's that whole circulation corridor that comes through this conference center because it's gotta hold hundreds of thousands of people in certain events. It's the same thing with a house or a backyard space. Those circulation patterns throughout a space are really important. I call that flow through the space. If it's awkward, we've all been in buildings or places that it's like the circulation doesn't work and it's confusing. Psychologically, you're like, this doesn't work well and you don't want to go back. But if you go to a space that works really well and you don't have to think about it, then ultimately you're like, wait, this, this actually feels really good and I want to be, I want to go back to the space again. Um, and the other thing is the existing site factors like we talked about earlier, the topography, because the grading and drainage is the other thing that's so important with any project. Because at the end of the day, if you do this incredible design and it looks good and it doesn't grade, the grading and the draining doesn't work and there's areas that hold water and the water doesn't hold, run off well, um, or the prevailing winds and other vegetation, the views that weren't taken into, in, into factor, then it's all a bust. So these are the three things that you have to really think about when you're at that bubble stage, that bubble diagram, to start initially laying out things. And program elements are, are really div divided into two different categories. You get your general program elements, which are all the simple things. I won't read all these, but the site circulation, hardscape, landscape, um, preliminary draining and drainage that we talked about. Those are things that are on every single project that you're always going to consider. But then you have the client-specific program elements. Those are the ones like I want a swimming pool, and it's got to be the certain size or the certain shape, and these are the elements I want within the pool itself. And these are other features, whether I want a grotto structure or a water feature, built-in kitchen, sunken seating area, pergola. The list can go on and on and on. Every year, it seems like everyone always asks us, what are the new trends in the marketplace? There's always something new that we factor in that we didn't think of before. But we have to, now, these, all these things that are plugging into the project that we have to make it work. It becomes fun, but also becomes very challenging, especially if the site's very challenging to begin with. So the one project that we're going to be walking through, this is, our, this is our initial sketch that we had with them. This was a corner, kind of a refined bubble diagram. We took all the principles of design that we talked about earlier, and those were all factored into this plan. Uh, we kind of been through this thousands of times, so we kind of knew what was important. But you could start seeing where we start. You could see the house. It's, oh, let's go back here. You could see the house. It's along the bottom here, and they wanted a, cool, a pool cabana, and we knew that we had a lot of grade that broke off on the, on the north part of the site, so we knew we had to have some sort of retaining wall. But we also knew we had circulation areas around the pool that was gonna be important. And the pool itself had all kinds of program elements that they wanted. They wanted an infinity, infinity edge that you could actually see from the house. So we actually had to have it facing somewhat back towards the house instead of away from the house. They wanted to actually partake in that. They also wanted a big activity area they knew they wanted a pergola on the back side of the pool for a destination. They wanted a, a zero entry into the, the project. And they talked about this idea of a sunken seating area that had a fire feature component added to it. And they, oh, by the way, we also want a spa. So it just, the list kept growing. 
At one point, they also wanted a grotto. So at some point, it's okay for a designer to tell a client no. Because if you can't fit all these program elements in, this is the stage you draw it in front of them and show them how there's just a lot going on here. And then as you get further developed in the project, you can actually show them why these things may or may not work. So then once we get past this above bubble diagram, we start refining that concept plan and tighten it up a bit. This is not drawn of the same project, but you can see that it's actually more refined. We've taken those elements and it's still black and white. It's still a drawing that has, for a client's perspective, you're not done with it yet because it's not rendered, it's not fully, it's not fully baked yet. So they could still have some input. And that's the reason we actually like drawing by hand because it has a lot more personality to it. I always tell people, uh, museums are still gonna be around 100 years from now. And why do people go to them by the groves? Because you get to go see personality, you get, whether it's a painter or a sculptor or someone that's doing something in three dimensions other than, or photography, those things always evolve and change and people have a different look at how they do things. Well, it's no different within a concept plan. When we draw something by hand, not everyone has the same technique of how they draw. We just have a technique that we like. It's actually more personalized with the client. It's more humanized. Sometimes people use computer-generated concept plans, which is not bad. It's just that it seems more cold and sterile. So we choose to do things by, in black and white. A master plan, on the other hand, the next phase that we start getting into is a dynamic long-term planning document that delineates a more refined layout for future build-out or development. And what we tell our client is that once we get through the concept plan phase and they've signed off on that, and we get into the master plan, the master plan really it provides four main things. The first one is it provides a comprehensive design direction for the owner approval. We want them to sign off at this stage in the game so they understand what they're getting into and what that end product is really gonna look like. The other thing it's good for is, is serving as an architectural review board or an HOA, Homeowners Association submittal. A lot of the subdivisions we're working on have strict guidelines on what you can and can't do. And they need to check off that box. That plan is used to submit for these applications. The other one is to be utilized for the initial estimate of, of probable construction cost. What we don't want to do is get all the way through construction documents and then send that out to contractors to get numbers and then the client gets freaked out because the project's 30% over budget. Early on we could take these plans because they're detailed enough that contractors can get pretty close. And we tell our clients that with an informed um, design narrative that we send out to contractors and talking to these guys that have worked with us for 15 plus years, they kind of know what to expect and they can get within that 10 to 15%. That's a little bit more um, tolerable for a client to understand that it, there is gonna be some flexibility, but at least they have a general understanding of what the overall project may cost. And the fourth reason is not all clients can do everything at once. So sometimes they need to pr provide some direction for phasing the project if they need to. So master plans. Our process, the deliverable is a colored, a colored plan. Uh, this is one of those projects I was talking to you about in Scottsdale. This was the plan that gets submitted to the HOA. This is the plan that gets submitted to the client for their final approval and to the general contractor and subcontractors so they can initially start putting some costs to these elements. Landscaping and paving and um, other materials that are on the site, the pool, the water features, all those things get factored into line items that ultimately add up to the overall cost of the project. And our process is that we, we do everything by hand but then we pull that into Photoshop and then we render it to give it more of that realistic feel. It's almost like a watercolor, but I think it's a little more palatable than a, 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 a computer generated plan that you actually get, get out of photo, Photoshop right out of the gate. But, um, so these are just different examples of projects that we've built throughout the design and, and have been built throughout the years. So this is the project that we're, we're continuing to talk about that, uh, um, that was built out that we originally had shown a picture of. This was the overall master plan. Uh, you could see a lot of the similarities from the initial aerial photograph that uh, we had um, We had all the, the components. Let me go back here if I can. You can see all the different components that they had in the, in the program. The pool house, the pool itself. They wanted an auto court. They had a lot of grade challenges that we had to use, retaining walls to help navigate the vertical challenges of the site. But ultimately what we're gonna talk about today is the backyard of the project. And the backyard is essentially uh, no different than we talked about earlier, is it had all these different components, but this was the master plan that was sent out to contractors for the initial cost estimate. And you can see this a lot, a little bit more defined. So they could pull dimensions off this. 
they can understand what the different program elements are, understand how many square foot of pool deck there's going to be, um, the different elevation changes in the pool uh, were also addressed with 3D exhibits that I'll show you here in a minute. But they were able to get pretty close with the, what they were going to try to accomplish with the backyard. And as you can see, this was, um, this was the initial, uh, this is a photograph of the site when it was all completed and how it tucks into the, the existing inf uh, infrastructure coming off the road, the existing uh, topography, uh, the, the vegetation, and how it was nestled into the site. So what I think is important when we're going through the design process is talking about that space program and adjacency. The results of the space programming and adjacent, space programming and adjacency is, is like we talked about the circulation of flow, position of spaces, separating unlike and like uses, the hierarchy, space clusters and groupings, furniture and equipment. These are all decisions that clients don't really understand that, wow, they, I, they don't realize that once you talk to them about this, that there's a lot that goes into design. It's not just drawing a pretty picture that you knock out in a couple hours. There's a lot more to it. And I'm going to go through each of these. So the client directed program elements, and what I'm going to do is kind of a backwards way of looking at this. I'm going to take a finished project, and I'm going to draw over the top of this to delineate how we came about doing this and what the client was asking for. You know, like we talked about earlier in the bubble diagram, the client wanted an activity area, and that was really important to them. They had a couple kids, and they wanted the space for them to actively play. They also wanted a lower pool. So initially, it was just going to be an infinity edge. But at a later date, they were like, well, if we're going to put a catch basin down there, why don't we not also utilize that for access? We can actually utilize it for our purposes of, of just an additional feature of the project. They wanted a beach entry. They wanted a spa, the sunken seating area, that pergola we talked about. The pool house was a big must for them because they were actually wanting to put an an extra room in that space for guests. They wanted an activity area with a TV uh, and, and other seating areas adjacent to the pool deck. And then we had the house entry and the grilling and dining area and then an open lawn. So these are all program elements and you gotta understand these were the client-directed program elements. We still have to look at all the other things that, we, that are important about a site, but these are the things that all have to magically fit together in, in, in an organized manner and in a water feature that we looked at and the gate entries, the list just keeps going on and on. Well, the circulation and flow like we talked about, um, given the variables of the pedestrian and vehicular circulation have a direct influence on the organization and an indirect relationship on the associations between the outdoor rooms. So when you look at the primary circulation in and around a pool, just like the corridors in this building, they take up a lot of space. And if there's not enough space, it's awkward because you can't fit it in furniture, you can't, you can't walk through the space real easily without you know, feeling like you're, you're pinched between a vertical wall and a, and, a, and a landscape bed. You want it to feel comfortable. But there's also secondary access points and pathways that don't take as much dominance on the entire design, like the one out to the, the secondary path that came out to the pergola structure, or access points that you know that you have to come in from the, from the, the, the driveway or from the house back into the dining space or exiting off to the back part of the property. These are all important but they take up a lot of space in the pool deck. So understanding circulation flow, we've already talked about this, but it's pedestrian path edges, uh, vehicular approaches, sometimes when you're looking at the entire site, entrance corridors and things like that. But the other thing we have to start looking at is, is the relationship of these outdoor rooms. We've often been places where things just don't seem to be in the right locations. So when we're talking to your clients, you have to understand what's important to them. How close do they want that house entry to certain aspects of the pool? A lot of times your beach entries, your reef ledges and tanning ledges want to be closer to the pool houses and other areas where there's close access and so parents can monitor kids that are playing. Or that's just an area where parents are going to sit and monitor kids in activity areas. Well, the sunken seating area was really important to them, but how do you figure that, factor that in to where it actually becomes overall component of the project? And then the spa. Does it become too far away from the master bedroom? Do they, don't, they, don't, do they mind walking around the outside of the pool to get to it? Or in cold winters like we have in Kansas, is it okay that, it's, that they want that just directly to the master bedroom? So all those factor into how these relate to one another, ultimately, and how you use the space and it functions. The other thing is to start thinking about unlike or like and unlike uses. On our commercial projects, we're, we're, we're asked that we have to have our over four season areas separated from 
are, are, are wet areas. And the reason for that is that they can't keep the pools open during the winter time. Well, the same thing with our residential pools. A lot of times the contractors um, uh, or the clients actually look at this and they, they may or may not heat the pool for the year long duration, but a lot of times they can't afford to do that. So they have to close down the pool. So what would be unfortunate is if you had your wet areas, which, which are only used about eight months out of the year, that are in, in a position where you can't get to some of your other areas where your pool deck is, you can be used year round. So if you have a nice day in January or February, but you can't use the pool, you can still access the pool deck and have a party or have uh, people congregate and have seating areas that flow out from other parts of the house. Um, so you have to identify where those dry areas are, those seating areas that make sense. And then you got other areas like your lawn areas. If kids want to go out and play in the lawn and actively use those kind of spaces, is it going to be wet or is it an area that they can actually utilize um, year round? The other thing is understanding from clients, whatever, it doesn't matter what kind of project, is have them high, provide a hierarchy of what their program elements are. If they come to you with 15 different program elements they want you to include in a project, you may or may not be able to actually incorporate all those based on their budget. So a lot of times we have them go in and tell us what is the most important to you so we can scale this thing back. As you can see here, the number one was the, the activity area, the second was the spa, the third was the reef entry, and the fourth was the lower receiving pool, and the fifth was the sunken seating area. So at some point, if the budget didn't, wasn't conducive to what they wanted to do, the top three might have been kept, and, and four and five might have been dropped off the radar. Those are the type of things that we have to talk to clients about early on, because what you don't want to do is paint this picture of this beautiful project that ultimately sounds great, but at the end of the day, they can't afford to do it, or can't afford to phase it in at a later date because it's just not conducive to construction of the project. The other thing to look at is furniture and equipment. If a client knows that they want to use a project in a certain way and they have certain furniture that they have in mind, you need to ask them early on what that is. Because if they want a certain sectional or certain kind of chase lounges, we have clients say, hey, we have five people in our family, we want five chase lounges and we want three others for guests that come over. Well, it's eight chase lounges you've got to find a place on the pool deck for. What you don't want to do is design a project and find out later that they can't get their furniture to fit. It just, it's, I've been on too many projects where you're walking through it and you could tell later they've put a pool furniture on it. And those were mistakes I made early on where they didn't tell you exactly what they were going to do. And you, you look back later and like, it just it doesn't work well. So those are the things that we had to talk through. Like the sunken seating area, they wanted to sit 12 people there. So we had to make it large enough that it would accommodate this type of, of guests when they had people, when they like to entertain. Same one with your grilling and dining. Do they want a harvest table? For, is it for six people, eight people, 12? Those are all important questions you must ask. The other thing that's really important about any project is that this is a good example. This is a two-dimensional graphic of a finished project. But when you're working on a, ma a concept plan or a master plan, you're working in two dimensions. It's hard for a lot of clients to visualize what a three-dimensional element may be and what its importance is. But a lot of times, we're working in, in a south of Kansas City, there's a, a lot of cities are just, really, a lot of the subdivisions are really flat. There's no topographic change on the sites. And so a lot of times we have to create vertical interest by either berming up areas of the site or creating vertical applications within the site features that provide the interest that clients are looking for. And that's why it's important early on to get pictures from your clients of inspiration because a lot of times you look at those and whether they know it or not, there's inspirational things in those that are vertical elements. And examples here, like the pool house, it's a vertical element, but it creates interest in how it divides its space proportion and scale with everything else is important. It's a vertical element that helps define the edge of that space. No different than the retaining wall or the pergola structure, the sunken seating area puts that user at a lower elevation within that space to look out over the project at a different vantage point. And they go, what do you mean by sunken seating area? I go, well, imagine being at the level of your dog and looking across the pool deck. It's a whole different um, perspective than actually standing at six foot or five foot with your eye elevation looking down on the project at all times. And we have some clients that rave about these spaces. Once they get built, they're like, oh my God, we have friends that come over and they, this is just a whole different experience. Nothing like it they could ever. So those are the things you've got to ask what, what's important to clients. The other thing that's important too is like your water features. In this case, they wanted a spa. The spa is going to spill off into the pool. It becomes a vertical element that becomes a point of interest. Um, same with the infinity wall. So in furnishings like umbrellas, I mean, it also is a vertical element. You've got to factor those in when you're designing a project. And then the influence of lighting. 
Uh, I think too often on projects, we design these, enti these entire projects and lighting, it becomes one of those budget items towards the end that never seems to work out. So what ends up happening is it gets kind of cut from the project. But as you can see here, there's so many different ways to handle lighting. And I think we did a good job on this project um, in so many different ways, whether it's tree lighting or festoon lighting, wall washes, landscape lighting, sterilizers. All those are, are items that you want to consider in the overall project. Accessibility and barriers. We know that we have to have fencing and walls. Those are all important. Gate entries, where do those get placed? how they get celebrated, if it's the main access into a backyard. And then ultimately, how many people does the client really want to entertain for? If you've got a project where they know they want 50 people, you better make sure that each of those areas can actually handle that. So you start showing what that means in the overall sense of the design. So then we get into 3D. And I know we've got about 15 minutes here. I want to keep, I'll push this a little faster. I'm sorry it's taking so long. But uh, a lot of times that could be in the form of hand sketch illustrations where we take initial concept and we're pulling it up real quickly in front of them um, with sketches that kind of show what that project may look like. Just quick, quick line work with notes and kind of give them three-dimensionally what that space might look like from different vantage points. Other things that we're doing is 3D modeling where we're getting into SketchUp and also uh, Lumion to create views like this where it's more realistic and a client can visualize what that looks like. A lot of our clients get challenged by looking at two-dimensional graphics and they, they struggle with that. So these are a lot of the pieces of software that are used in the industry. We're primarily using SketchUp and Lumion. The project that we were talking about, this was the initial 3D SketchUp model that we pre prepared. The things that were different here, the pool house is a different angle. Some of the site features, I talked about the grotto that they wanted that we pulled out of the project. We told the client, no, at some point you just gotta say, there's too much is too much. And then we modified that as we we're going through the process. Back then when we did this project, we didn't, weren't using Lumion, so we didn't take it to that realistic view. But you could see what Lumion can do. It's a, it's a project that really can make a space look really realistic. And these are all projects we've designed throughout the years. Materials and finishes are really important, whether it's building materials and architectural finishes. Just like this show, walking around the show, you can see that there's so many different ways to handle selection of materials. The size, the scale, the color, the texture all have a different impact on what that finished project may look like. As you can see here, this is decorative paving done in so many different ways, but it gives a different feel for the project. Whether it's mid-century modern or it's very uh, traditional, lodgy, I mean, there's right materials for the right project. But we try to hold off on this until the very last because obviously, these are things that clients want to start talking about. And it's not that those aren't important, but these are things that we want to get to later in the game so that we can actually start applying those to the design that was created. Same with the textures and shapes and colors of plant material and how they ultimately impact. As a landscape architect, this is really important to me, and it's a fun part of the process. And the construction documents. Uh, that's where everything meets, you know, the rubber meets the road. Um, how is this going to get built? How are contractors going to put a number to it so they can actually uh, get this in front of the client, get it approved, get a schedule? And nowadays we know that things are escalating a lot, but this also becomes an insurance policy for the homeowner, the contractor, and the designer. You kind of tie yourselves to the hips at that point in time to understand that moving forward, whether it's layout and dimensioning plans, grading and drainage, or details for a project like we presented, all come together and actually can get built in a manner that's... Um, that's tied to local regulations and construction methodologies that are gonna be tried and true and you know the project's gonna last for a long time. 3D modeling, we've recently, over the last four or five years, started modeling pool equipment sets because you wanna make sure that the contractor knows how that's gonna fit in that space. And this was the finished project that we completed. Um, you can see that this is the view that Infinity Edge, they wanted to, to see portions of it flowing off the back side of the, of the Infinity Wall from the house, the pergola on the back side, you start seeing some of the vertical elements and how it starts shaping the space in and around the project. The sunken fire feature area, the spa that spills over into the reef ledge and zero entry. And this is where a client is happy because they, they trusted the process and they understand that there is a reason why we go through this. And it's supposed to be fun. You don't want it to be belaboring through the process where it's 
Usually clients are real excited through all the design phase. During construction documents, they kind of go away because <laughs> that's when we're grinding through the details, but at least they understand that we're heading in the right direction. You know, I, I just tell people, trust the process and the process will work for you. Thank you. Is there any questions I could answer? Um, I think we got like 10 minutes left. I, I, is, does someone have, it's hard for me to see with this light, so. No questions? Okay, oh yeah, right here, sorry. What's that? Oh, the presentation? Um, I don't mind sharing. I could, it's a really big file, so it'd have, it'd have to be in the form of a Dropbox <laughs> so that someone could actually utilize it. But yeah, I don't mind doing that if you want to give me your card afterwards. Any other questions? Yep. On a residential side, it's working with the personal, the client, because you get to know them. A lot of the products that we're working with are, they do take some time. These aren't quick churn and burn projects. We're, so we really, you're engaging with that client to the point where they almost, a lot of what clients become friends and people that you associate with for years to come. And so to me, to see them walk through this entire process and enjoy it, and then see the final project after it's been completed, that to me, that's a joy. And so I really enjoy getting to, getting to know the clients along the way. So, yeah. So the question was about trends, right? Uh, trends have changed throughout the years, but recently, like I'd mentioned earlier, uh, sunken fire feature areas have been really, um, the use of materials. It's crazy. Uh, when I first got into the pool industry about 12, 13 years ago, a lot of the, the pool contractors in my market were using porcelain tile, the six by six for water lines. Now we're using a little bit of everything. And um, from glass tile, large format tile, um, so again, you don't have as many grout lines. Uh, the different uses of coping. Uh, so materials really change the overall aesthetic of our project, but also water features. Uh, we try to create new ways to move water. I mean, you're obviously in a water feature, but there's a lot of common things on the marketplace like shear descents and scuppers, but we, a lot of clients in our market, they traditionally like the landscape pools, so grottos have become really big. We've done a lot of grottos over the last half a dozen years. Um, but there's always something new that we're having to engage in that overall process. Yeah. Any other questions? Is there one over here? No, I'm sorry, yeah. Yep. Are you talking, the question was more about how do, I, how do you, how do, how do you uh, oversee the, the cost? Is that what you're saying is gauge that? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's why I'm a big firm believer in having two flushes of cost estimates or a cost estimate and then a final bid. I think too often a lot of people go through and get to construction documents too soon in the process. The client's really excited because they've seen all these beautiful illustrations, whether it's two dimensional plans or 3D graphics. And then they get excited, they get the construction doc, let's get the construction documents done, let's get this thing implemented, and it comes in 30% over budget. So I, I'm a real big proponent of slowing our clients down, getting through the concept plan phase so they approve that, get to the master plan phase. And then three-dimensional graphics have become huge for us because clients, it, it's, it, it costs a little bit of money on the front end to do something in three dimensions. But it's, it's, a lot, it's, it's a lot less than the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're going to spend building a project out. So then what happens, those 3D exhibits, the, the master plan, other inspirational images and things are sent to our contractors. And then I write a design narrative to the contractors that we've worked with over the years to ex describe to them what the level of expectation is from a design perspective and what the clients are looking for. And generally speaking, those contractors will be within 10 to 15% of what the overall budget is. And the reason I say 10 to 15% because the client may or may not have already selected all the materials for the project. 
Because as we know, whether you're going out and picking out a car or a house, however you finish a, a, you know, a, a, a kitchen space or how, what selections you pick on that new BMW, that price gets adjusted from those materials and finishes and the additions that you add to it. It's no different than the outdoor space, whether it's tile or pool deck material, stone, dimensional stone, uh, you know, all those things have a factor on the overall cost. So if you set that expectation early on with the contractors during that master plan phase, then they at least have an understanding of what that cost could be so that later when they choose to make a different selection for a waterline tile or an infinity edge material, they know that they had an allowance for X and now all of a sudden it's three times X if they make that decision. Client expectations, uh, lead times on materials, and uh, just having contractors at the labor pool right now. Uh, fortunately, when I first moved to Kansas City, because I come from a construction background, I built a lot of relationships with local contractors and craftsmen that are really good at what they do. And they've followed our clients around for years to build these projects. And, and what's been nice about that is, at least I could tell our clients that when I talk to them, that I have contractors I can align them with that are going to execute at a really high level. The challenge is, Bill, going back to the client expectation, is letting them know that this isn't going to happen overnight. I mean, you're not going to be in your pool six months from now. The pool contractors in our market are all anywhere from two to two and a half years out. So it's one of those things where they have, I tell our client, you have to, to begin building that expectation, design now, do it right, get it approved, get your materials selected, and then once you understand what those materials are, let's get them ordered. Because not only the price is going to go and escalate up 30 or 40 percent over a course of a year, but there's also longer lead times. We have a separate business where we actually have a showroom and we actually go out and procure materials for our clients. So it's more of an integrated process with the design. But that, that takes a lot of time, not only to go through the process and select the right materials for the project, but some things that were used to be six-week lead times are now three-months lead times, lead time on product products. And so we have to let our clients know that if you want those things on the job site ready for the contractor to install, we need to order those now. Any other questions? What's your favorite pin draw list? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've got three pins that I like. I, there's a, um, a Stedler 0.3 that I like. It's a, pin, a felt tip pin. There's a sign pin that I like to use for big concept work. And um, there's another repeat, another repeater graphic kind of pin that I like as, as well. But we, we, we love hand graphics. So just it, it really sets the stage for what we do. It kind of sets us apart. Well, I thank you all for joining. This has been really incredible. Thank you. Uh -huh.